All right, good day, folks. I'm Christopher Beast, and pop up slide on my screen. <laughs> Okay, and I've been involved with embedded systems um, since my first professional job about uh, 20 years ago. And these days I specialize in the, in the Internet of Things, which is the new word for embedded systems that don't work properly. <laughs> so I work with, with companies developing IoT devices to help them choose the right technologies and practices um, to build, test, and deploy their products. Um, I've also worked in banking security. Um, then I spent six years trying to uh, prevent the school children of New South Wales from accessing pornography. Um, and then I, uh, I moved into the more sedate world of internet gambling. So I've learned a thing or two along the way about risks. And today I want to tell you about how to defend yourself from your dishwasher. Um, it's been said that IoT devices are kind of like vampires. Once you invite them into your home, you have no power over them. You don't know what threats they bring in. Um, you have no easy way of examining or updating the software that's on them. So first I'm going to outline some risks of deploying IoT and then talk about how and why those risks arise. Um, then, pretty much for shits and giggles, I'll... I'll point and laugh at some particularly shameful examples of bad practices, and after that I'll cover what you can do to select well-behaved products, um, to protect yourself from rogue devices, and then for the main course we'll go into the, the practices and tools that you ought to use that are going to help you avoid ending up in the wall of shame in the next time I deliver this talk. And then finally I'll finish on a brighter note and tell you a bit about some things that are coming down the pipeline. Um, to make things a little easier, and there will be links at the end um, of the things that I mentioned, and I will put these slides up on, on the Meetup um, page after the presentation. So this isn't really going to be one of those talks that just bleats about how everything in the IoT is awful. Um, unfortunately, everything is awful, but in my opinion, none of this is really intrinsic to IoT. The problems... Um, I happen to think that the current situation in IoT is a bit like the American Wild West. It's a brief moment in history where um, innovation and growth is really running ahead of the law and common sense. But what is different about IoT is the collection of risks arising from some of these bad practices. Um, so first, I want to examine what are those risks and how we can avoid them. Um, late last year, one of those risks... Um, I've lost control of my... So, as I was saying, I want to talk about what risks IoT devices present. Our first risk is unauthorised access to your devices. So if the device is a video camera or something like that, it's pretty obvious that the risk is embarrassment, violation, blackmail, burglary. Um, but the threats vary by who the perpetrators might be. 
Um, you may have to worry about people who have a particular malicious interest in you if you're a celebrity or if you have a vindictive ex. Um, then you, you've got a particular risk of a, of a persistent threat. Um, we've already seen celebrities um, targeted through their home cameras. Secondly, much like we're seeing ransomware and, and such things go wild in the PC world, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see bad actors um, attempting to harvest compromising video and then blackmail people. Um, I mean, besides Donald Trump. <laughs> Finally, there's, there's mass data collection, uh, either by randos driving around looking for vulnerable devices, or by state-level actors even. We, we know from, from some leaks that some intelligence agencies um, have developed the ability to, to subvert um, IoT devices. So earlier this year, Amazon launched a version of their, their Echo device, which, which has a camera that can actually tell you, does your bubble look big in this? There, there's stated application for this device. It's put one in your bedroom and have it check out your outfits. I'm not super keen on that idea. I'm not sure that putting a camera in everybody's bedroom is a great idea. So our next risk is unauthorised control of your devices. Um, a proof of concept was done recently where a bunch of guys flew a quadcopter around a neighbourhood and took over all the smart light bulbs and they were able to turn people's lights off just by flying past their house. Um, and you can bet that someone's working on the same trick for your front door. <laughs> Vandalism is an issue too. I, I don't want to see someone work out how to wreck every garage door in the city or switch off every pacemaker in the room. A couple of years ago, the electric authority in, in Puerto Rico um, was said to be losing $400 million a year because an insider um, leaked information on how to bypass all the tamper-resistant controls on the electricity meters by shining infrared light through the plastic casing. Um, now, you might like free electricity, or maybe somebody will uh, reprogram petrol pumps to give free petrol, or supermarket checkouts to give free groceries. Um, but you probably wouldn't like it if somebody made all the traffic lights go green all at once, or um, shut off all the electricity meters during a, uh, a blizzard. And the risk we saw happen last year was mass takeover of devices. In that case, um, we had hundreds of thousands of internet connected security cameras um, infected by a worm named Mirai, and, and what this did was it used them to perpetrate a denial of service attack against services like Twitter and Facebook and shut down much of the internet for an afternoon. Um, another incident, um, last Thanksgiving weekend in the United States, the, the San Francisco train system was shut down, um, and the rumour is there that they actually had to to pay up uh, to have the ransomware removed. Now, just last month we had a, an incident where hospitals, railways, police cameras and other critical infrastructure was affected by some malware. It looks like it, it was an actual act of, of war disguised as ransomware. Um, this time there was no getting your data back. Uh, this, although it appeared to be ransomware, it, it turned out that uh, once your files were gone, they were really gone. So what if your car wouldn't start, if your TV showed banner ads that you couldn't get rid of, if your light started strobing on and off and, and kept doing it until you paid a ransom? And of course, there's, there's just plain old network intrusion. Um, most networks are set up to detect attacks from the outside. They're not particularly good about dealing with when you bring a threat into the building. There was a report that was published last week um, that tells the story of a United States casino that was compromised via their fish tank, an actual <laughs> fishing attack. Um, attackers got into this IoT-enabled smart fish tank, they used that to get onto the casino network, and then they set up a, an outbound connection that, that tunneled certain critical data out to a, a site in Finland. Um, and the, the, the issue here is that most of our firewalls are set up to handle outside threats, they're not very good at dealing with restricting outbound traffic. And even if they attempt to do that, there is just so many ways to leak information out of a network. So, you know, it's a case that the monsters are inside the room already. Um, an IoT device is, 
if they rely on cloud services, then again you've got the risk that those services become compromised. And I'll give a, a pretty scary example of that in a, in a moment. So at this point, you might just want to bury your head in the sand. Um, maybe you want to round up all the devices in your home or office and bury them in the sand. You've really got every right to be somewhat despondent. You know, many of the devices that are out there are easy to install, they're poorly tested, they've got low quality user interfaces, no provision for updates. It's almost like we need DevOps. <laughs> this state of affairs is really due to bad practices, and so that's, that's what I want to talk a little bit about next. The majority of the security issues that, that I and others find are caused by people who just should have known better. I'm talking about mistakes that professionals shouldn't be making. Um, things like insecure communications, notionally secure protocols that aren't being used right, relying on security by obscurity, failing to sanitise data, and then there's problems that are due to laziness. Uh, leaving debug passwords is active in production hardware, hard coding default passwords that, that, that can't be changed, using quick and dirty web servers that are vulnerable to command injections. Uh, that Milo worm had access to about half a million devices with just a list of 60 default passwords in, in common equipment. Um, and you know, I've got some cameras myself that, that run a Telnet server for administration access. Uh, I don't know the password. The vendor couldn't tell me the password. There's no way to turn it off. So you know, I don't feel safe using that kind of device on my network. Um, and I, I moved on to the NBN last week and I had the same problem. The router that the ISP sent me has a Telnet server in it. I don't know the password. I don't, they're going to tell me the password. Um, if, if somebody found out how to generate those passwords, then I've really got no defense against them. Another thing I want to touch on is usability. Um, there was a, a conference earlier in the year where one of the keynotes said that we as geeks owe it to our less technical friends to design user interfaces and systems that they can understand and use. It shouldn't take a four-year degree to operate a toaster. Vendors shouldn't presume that you have to be a system administrator um, just to manage household devices or, or simple office devices. We, as technical people, need to build products that our less technical friends can use um, without blowing themselves up. It, it's a fair trade, I think. We geeks um, make the world a better place and our more grounded friends remind us to eat. <laughs> but I do want to point out that most of these failures are not an intrinsic characteristic of IoT. We had the same problem in the 80s with, with early PCs, with mainframes, we had the same problem in the 90s with early Windows PCs on the internet. We had it again in the noughties with mobile phones. We had it just recently with, with cloud services. The common culprit here is you. Well, probably not you, because you're here learning how not to do this, but the enemy is us. You know, the security on some of these devices is just criminally bad. I wonder at times, late at night, whether some of it is actually deliberately bad. Um, we know that intelligence agencies plant moles to try and hamstring devices, but in the end it doesn't really matter whether it's accidental or deliberate. The solution for us as software professionals is to ensure that we adopt tools and processes that assure quality outcomes um, and protect against these issues wherever they arise. So there's another way that IoT is a bit like PCs in the 90s, and that's fragmentation. Every product at the moment is different. There's very little attempt to, to leverage reusable components, and that means that you either put all your resources into building one user interface once and reuse it, or you build to a half assed job over and over again. And I, you know, I see that some of the vendors out there went for plan B. Um, but once again, this is something that's fixable. And with the right industry action, uh, there is a glimmer of hope that that's going to happen. So the last fault I want to talk about is once you get a device working, you've kind of peaked. It's all downhill from there. 
most devices have no update options, um, and in some cases there's not even any useful brand name identification that would let you find out who made it. So if there's a bug, you probably won't know. If you do know, then there's probably no patch, and if you complain, there's probably no one who cares. So we get mad when devices like computers and phones stop getting OS updates. Um, after a couple of years maybe. Imagine having to replace your oven or your dishwasher because it's two years old and there's no more software updates. Um, I don't think that would go down very well. So this means that the support horizon for consumer products really has to be significantly extended. And that's going to be a burden on manufacturers, un undoubtedly. Um, what they're going to need are the ability to roll out fixes for old products quickly and promptly and, and deploy them out to the field with minimal fuss. Sounds like they need DevOps. So now I want to look into the under, underlying reasons why this mess arises. For a start, every barrel has a bottom. Um, other markets have got rubbish products too. I keep saying this a lot, but I see it's getting bad press due to awful quality, but most of the causes aren't really particular to embedded systems. What, what, what I'm seeing is an education problem. One of the issues with IoT that is a natural consequence of the environment is that the lower cost of the products and the short product cycles reduce the scope that you have for good design. Um, and secondly, since we're still in an immature industry, things are moving fast and the tools that are um, in the field are entirely appropriate for some of the new applications. So I think the sector will mature in time um, and a big part of that is evolving the tool set that can provide a solid foundation for security and interoperability while better addressing the, the market constraints of, of cost and time to market. So it's almost like we need DevOps. Um, so I said before that the fragmentation is a pain. Uh, we've got to get past everybody inventing their own wheel. Um, big incumbents have been particularly bad at this. Um, and I wouldn't really be surprised if, um, if some of those those big historical players fade away um, from competition from more agile and upstarts. Um, when, you, when you're paying 10 times as much for a, for a big name brand and you get the same awful security and awful user interface as, as a brown box import, um, then there's no, there's no real incentive to go with the big manufacturers. So I probably don't need to tell you people that security is fundamentally hard, um, but some of the people working in IoT I think don't really understand how hard. Um, a lot of the flaws arise from developers who who think, why would anybody bother to attack a dishwasher? Um, but that's really the wrong question. There's enough script kiddies and organised crime gangs and rogue intelligence agencies out there, and it's easy enough to scan for devices. Um, you can't rely on obscurity to protect you. Um, you know, there's seven billion on the pe people on the planet, and it only takes one of them to to take it into their head to to write a piece of malware, um, and it can spread worldwide. Um, it used to be said that an, that an unpatched Windows PC on the on the internet would be would be hacked within four minutes. Um, an IoT researcher named Rob Graham did the same experiment with an IoT camera a few months ago, and he found 70 seconds was the was the time that he was seeing. Um, and last month, this, this wiper malware that originated in the Ukraine um, had spread worldwide within a few hours. <coughs> so, to follow on from that, a, a huge proportion of IoT vulnerabilities are really about using the wrong tool for the job, or from shipping software that doesn't need to be on the device. Um, it's common to just install a complete Linux distribution on a device and ship it without bothering to, to remove unnecessary parts. And this leads to vulnerabilities that could have been avoided. Kind of sounds like we need DevOps. So this is an area where there are some promising solutions. Um, and then what these things do is, is they take the hard work out of securing your devices for you. And finally, there's almost no incentive to do better. If your IoT device um, gets turned into a botnet zombie, you probably don't even notice. It doesn't have a user interface. Probably don't even notice it slows down. Um, so if the buyer doesn't care, there's not a lot of pressure on the vendor to care. Okay, so let's take a break 
um, from the grim gloom to do a bit of pointing and laughing. Um, first, I want to tell you about the Mirai.net. Um, so, Mirai was a worm um, that came to fame around last October. Um, and as I said, it uses a list of about 60 known passwords to attack um, low end video cameras and security equipment. Um, and it took some major social media platforms offline for most of the day. And the root cause here is really that devices that ask the firewall to open up ports to the outside internet um, while having fairly fundamental security vulnerabilities. Um, so since October, we've had a, a couple of evolutions of this worm. We've had one which actually tries to inoculate systems against the bug. We've had another one which tries to destroy vulnerable systems. And we've had one which enrolls them as, as Bitcoin miners. Um, and when I first started writing about this, this topic um, a year or so ago, um, I made some predictions about some of the horrible things that might happen. And I'm afraid to say that a few of them have, have come true. Um, you might think that the, the lesson of the Mirai debacle is to stick to name brands. Um, but in just the last six months, we've had similarly embarrassing security incidents from Sony, Samsung, Siemens, Hyundai, Netgear, D-Link, and more. Um, we've had cars that anyone can start, and we've had hearts that anyone can stop. Last August, um, an investor started short-selling a maker of pacemakers um, after trying for several months to get them to pay attention to his bug reports about the security in their implanted devices. Um, and it's since emerged that the manufacturer had already known about those problems for several years. So it turns out that knocking 10% of the value off a company by, by going public with their, um, with their flaws is an excellent way to get their attention because not long after that they did finally patch the problems. So another of the, uh, the more humorous items uh, is from March when it emerged that there is such a thing as an internet connected dishwasher and it's pretty much trivial to steal its password file. Now, you might think that there's no safety risk that, that, that could arise from a dishwasher, um, but this particular device is an industrial sanitizer used in hospitals and, and food applications. Um, and I used to think the term cyber warfare was bunk, but there, there, there is a, a significant amount of mayhem that you could engender by subverting everyday devices. Um, you know, this Ukrainian cyber warfare business that, that initiated that worm last month well, took down the chocolate factory in Hobart. That's <laughs> um, so we need to have ways to manage whole fleets of devices and protect them from spreading threats. So I think we need DevOps. <coughs> so lastly, in a story that broke in, in February, and I love this one, um, sometimes the risks come from where you least expect them. So cloud pets, which don't entirely look like that, are a teddy bear that lets children record messages for absent parents. It's divorce as a service. Um, only it turned out that the user account data was being stored in a cloud database that had no password, and the recorded messages were being stored in a, in a web server that would serve the files to anyone who could guess the password. Sorry, guess the file name. Um, so it was fairly straightforward to obtain the name, address, voice recordings, details of any child or every child in the system. Um, and some journalists spent a number of months trying to attract the attention of the manufacturers who finally um, replied that no, there was no problem, uh, despite the fact that since that time their database had actually been deleted and replaced by a ransom demand from some Russian hackers. Um, so, end of interlude, um, I now want to give you some constructive advice if you're bringing IoT into your network and later on if you're building it. Um, I've gone into detail in the past on, on how to select and buy devices sensibly. I'm, I'm going to gloss over that tonight because I hope that you guys are technical enough to, to understand. But essentially it comes down to vote with your wallet. Um, if, if stuff looks awful, if it's hard to use, if it's obviously insecure, send it back. Send the manufacturers a message. Um, and you can use compatibility as an asset test. If it works with a major framework like the ones from Apple or Google, um, if it supports open protocols, then that's a good sign that it's, that it's well constructed. Um, if it's been tweeted about like, by somebody like Matthew Garrett, then it's a really bad sign. 
Um, on gadget sites, you can't really trust the reviews because a lot of the gadget sites are incentivizing people with loyalty points to give reviews. So the good reviews are kind of worthless. The bad reviews you can probably believe because there's, there's no real incentive to give bad reviews. So supposing you have found something that you can, you can pay money for without wanting to cry, let's, let's talk about um, how to deploy it safely. First of all, you should put your IoT devices on a separate network. Don't put your fish tank on the same network as your um, file servers or your banking records or whatever. Um, so if you're using enterprise routing gear, then it's easy enough to set up a, a separate Wi-Fi network. If you've got consumer grade gear, then perhaps you can you can replace it with one of the open source firmwares. And if you, you're stuck with with stock consumer firmware, then a lot of routers these days have guest networks. So you could set up a guest network, put all your IoT stuff on that, and then it's outside your firewall. So if it does go rogue on you, it's not going to be causing problems for you. It can still be causing problems for the rest of the internet. Um, in that case, one of the things you can do is turn off universal plug and play. Uh, you don't want devices to be able to override the firewall. Um, and if you can't set up a whole separate network, then perhaps give your devices a fixed IP in your range and then block that fixed IP range at the, at the firewall. Next, think about what could happen if your devices go broke. So every device probably only needs to talk to one or two things. So if you can work out what that is, um, then you can whitelist the device and be able to access that. Secondly, you could use traffic shaping to say, okay, this device only needs to, to talk to a, a management server, so limit it to a, a fairly low low data rate. Um, and once again, you, if you've got a, a consumer grade router, you can probably use the child protection features in it to, to apply those rules. Um, so in the event that a device does go rogue, you want to be able to find it. So make sure you've got a, a record of which device is which. Now I've got something like 50 I, um, Wi-Fi devices in my house at the moment. So tracking down the one that's, that's causing trouble it becomes exponentially more difficult the more you get at these things. Um, there is a, a nice mobile app that I like called Fing, which essentially scans your network and tells you what everything is. And they just uh, this week shipped a, a little hardware widget which is aimed at consumers that you plop it down on your network, plug it into your router, and it scans your network and tells you every time there's a new device or if there's a traffic spy or if there's suspicious looking traffic. So it's an IDS. Of, of a kind that is aimed at consumers who don't know what an IDS is. So this kind of stuff I think we'll start seeing a, a fair bit more of. Um, so once you've installed some devices, um, you want to keep an eye on them. You want to check your traffic stats. Um, you want to um, look for anything hinky. And, um, and we are starting to see some, some, some promising tools in this space. Um, once again, it's more stuff we need DevOps. So, once again, if you, if you selected the right device, then hopefully you're not locked into whatever low quality cloud services come with the device. Um, there's an open source project that I quite like called HomeKit, which lets you take incompatible devices or, or walled garden devices and patch them into, into Apple's IoT ecosystem so that you no longer have to use 15 different iPhone apps to control your house or your office, you can do it all through the one. Um, similarly, if you're using Amazon's Alexa frameworks, there's open source software you can get for that, which lets you patch in things which wouldn't normally work with it. And if you're, you're doing security cameras and that kind of thing, then there's, um, there's a couple of open source products. There's one called Motion, there's one called... Um, from Brains Armander, which again let you firewall off these devices and, and control them with a local hub. So I want to change tack now and give you some advice for developing IoT devices. Um, and basically it's get someone else to do the hard part for you. Um, and really let complexity emerge from the simplest possible behaviours. I, I like to think of the internet as the fifth computing revolution. We had the first mainframes, one computer per company. Uh, the desktop revolution brought it to one per person. Mobile revolution made, got us to maybe between two and five devices per person. Um, cloud computing came along and we started to lose count. 
And, and I think that with IoT, we'll be seeing computers outnumbering people by 100 or 1,000 times. Um, so the practices that we have been using for management, deployment, monitoring of these devices just aren't going to scale. Either we, even if we, even if we retrain every imminently redundant Uber driver, as I said, we still don't have the manpower. It's almost like we need DevOps. So if you're developing for the Internet of Things, you need to recognise that an IoT device is a little bit different than a, than a PC. Uh, the goal of IoT is to make computing invisible and ubiquitous. And so the consequence of that is the devices have to be resilient, self-reliant, and self-healing. Uh, there isn't a human operator around to, to notice if there's a problem. So you should limit what, what software you put on the devices, um, and to have complexity come from cooperation rather than building everything into one device. Um, you know, lots of drones, a handful of queens. Uh, it's entirely feasible and ridiculously cheap just to put Debian Linux on a box and bolt to the wall, but don't. Uh, don't ship any software with your device that, doesn't, that it doesn't need. And developer backdoors are going to be found. Um, but minimal environments, they're inconvenient to develop. Developers. So you need to use your deployment architecture to route around lazy developers. Um, that means automate building of a production firmware that has only what it needs and a development version that has all the, the debugging tools. And then um, if you need to debug, you can, you can deploy a, a, um, a development version out to a device. So it turns out that some of the tools you would use to do this are just the same ones that we all use in our data centers. Um, application containment means that if you do get compromised, you can limit the damage. Um, and combined with a minimalist host operating system um, and network containment, you've got defense in depth. Um, this little, where did I put it? I've lost it. This little box here costs, I think, $7 US. Um, and it's got a quad core processor, half a gig of RAM, runs Docker just fine. Um, so when I build IoT architectures for my clients, I, I put components into Docker containers and, and provision one or more containers out to these devices. Uh, and I use the same kind of tools that you would do to do that in, in a data center. Um, Chef and Ansible are both good tools. I, I find SaltStack particularly useful in this space because it's architecture of using a, a client-initiated message bus connection back to either a central server or to a, through a tree of, of servers um, naturally resembles the kind of arrangement that you would want to have with your devices. You would have a, a building level controller and maybe a city level controller and then maybe a global one. Um, and ever since the 70s we've had industrial control companies um, doing PLCs and SCADA, and these guys are really quite conservative in, the, in their technologies. Um, and a big part of the problem is that this is a sector that hasn't really been exposed to DevOps principles and doesn't understand what it means. Um, and so the, the same old problems of sort of massive over-engineering and, and vendor lock-in are, are still there in that space. Um, and so I think that Really, the, the newer frameworks, the fresh start, is, is, is what's going to bring value in IoT rather than some of the legacy platforms. And there is a huge land grab going on in the consumer space and in the cloud space, and I think that's really going to harm, harm some of those incumbent industrial players. The cloud vendors have all firmly gotten behind IoT. So we've got Amazon, Google, Microsoft, um, all providing frameworks which, which let you interface IoT devices to the cloud. And, and manage the, the data and the, the fleets of devices. Um, and this makes a heck of a lot of sense because the Internet of Things isn't just about the things, it's about the internet working and what you do with the data. So I, I do like what Amazon are doing, um, and to some, to some extent Apple haven't entirely screwed it up. Um, Google is playing catch up, uh, but they're moving really fast. Um, the Google Home Appliance just hit the market here last week and it's flying off the shelves, I hear. Microsoft have announced uh, their entry into the space, although it's um, mostly glossies and vapor at the moment. Uh, I'll go deeper into all those frameworks in a minute. Um, in the open source 
space, there's, there's been a, a lot of consolidation. Um, so if you are researching in the area, you'll find references to frameworks that don't exist anymore or have merged with other ones. Um, the big one at the moment is, is the Open Connectivity Foundation, which has subsumed a number of other projects. Um, in May, we had an, another um, group of companies um, from AMD through the Zingbox um, come together under the Linux Foundation uh, to announce something that they call the EdgeX Foundation, um, which is about developing an open IoT framework. It hasn't got a lot of, a lot of um, detail to it yet, but I'm, I'm keeping an eye on that. It's, it's almost becoming a bit exhausting keeping up with, with developments in the space. Uh, there's a number of early entrants that have run out of steam, and there's a number of new ones which are moving quite fast, and I'll go into some of the newer ones in a minute. Um, but first I want to digress a bit and talk about general development practices. There's really no substitute for quality and awareness. You have to have people who know what the risks are, who can see to avoid them, and, and understand whether or not you're meeting your goals. Um, if I could really give you one piece of advice today, you don't embed shell scripts. Um, but besides that, I'll, I'll speak about some resources to guide you later and a bunch of links at the end as well. Um, one more thing on, on practices, please don't rely on a mobile app to set up. Um, if you have to deploy a thousand devices, you may get more happy with that. Um, think about some way to, to deploy things in bulk. Um, you really need to make sure your product scales, your architecture scales. And that probably means some kind of tree-shaped architecture, not a million devices phoning home to one tiny little cloud server. Um, and again, the good frameworks will help you here. Uh, the cloud vendors have just invented a term they call edge computing, which I think is their recognition that traditional put all your eggs in one basket scaling isn't really going to work for the Internet of Things. Similarly, um, message bus technologies are all the rage in the, the enterprise application space at the moment, and they're a good fit to, to IoT. So the grandmother of them all is, is a protocol called MQTT, um, which is a really lightweight message bus protocol uh, that was intended for use in embedded devices. Um, but if you want to use, work with Apache Kafka or Amazon Kinesis, then it's, it's possible to work with those technologies as well. Um, last thing on practice is uh, stay away from passwords if you can. Public key crypto and and the use of SSL for client authentication has always been a bit rare because it's a pain in the neck to distribute the client certificates. But with IoT, you've got a channel that already exists for shipping the certificate. It's the device. There it is. Um, so that, that part of the puzzle is solved for you. And on device support, um, recognise that everybody will lose the instructions. So put a link or a QR code or something on the device so that people can find the documentation when they want it. And really you need to decide before you ship what the support life of your product is going to be. Um, it sounds mean, but maybe consider using certificates or, or services to end of life a device after you stop supporting it. Um, it's, it's safer than really having something out there that is a liability. Um, uh, and you should think perhaps about building in feature switches that allow people to turn off subsystems either that they don't want to use or that there is a problem with. So if the CIA happens to leak another bug in some particular network protocol, then people can go and turn that off in their devices and, and loop along until a patch comes out. So almost finished. The last thing I want to go into is the light at the end of the tunnel. So various groups have, have recognised the need to get serious. Um, there's a mob called the Broadband Internet Technology Advisory Group, which has got Google and Intel and Microsoft and, and a bunch of other organisations involved. And they put out a, a white paper last November that talks about best practices for IoT security. And if I was going to boil it down to one sentence, it would be don't be lazy and stupid. Um, but in broad, it, it's, it's what I've been telling you about tonight. Um, and it's an excellent checklist of, of things to think about. Um, I've mentioned the Open Connectivity Foundation, and you know, I approve of the work they're doing. Um, as Bob Martin said at, at the Yale conference last year, if we don't act to improve the professionalism of software development, then governments are going to do it for us, and we probably won't like what we get. 
Um, and Bruce Schneier, who's, who's well known to security people, is also saying that some kind of consumer quality regulation in the IoT space is necessary. And he's got the ear of a lot of governments, so there's a good chance of there being movement on that. So let's look um, a little bit deeper at some of the some of the frameworks and the options you have for getting someone else to do the hard work for you. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is Apple's HomeKit API. Um, and typically for Apple, you've got to jump through a, a few hoops to get your device onto their platform. Um, but the flip side of that is that once a device is in the market, you can be relatively sure that it hasn't got really basic problems in its operation. Um, and Apple does the right thing by not putting too much intelligence in every device. They have a home hub which can compose behaviours of simple devices. So if you have a sensor and you have a light or a fan or air conditioning, then you can say, when this sensor sees this thing happen, do that thing over there. And so complexity emerges from simple behaviours. Um, and they announced a, a home hub product in June, which will be shipping here in, a, in uh, November. So um, they'll be next on the market after Google, who, who launched last week. Um, and one more thing I like about Apple is that they support a common abstraction for security cameras. So if you have a bunch of security cameras that you want to be able to talk to from the internet, then you don't need to open them up to the net. You just talk to your, your building hub, and the building hub then talks to the cameras with local connections. Amazon's offering is, is also good. Um, predictably, it's, it's centered around their AWS technologies. Uh, it's built on top of MQTT, and it adds a thing that they call a shadow document, which is a, a mechanism for storing the configuration when the device is offline. So it's an excellent technology for when you, you maybe not connect to the internet all the time. Um, there's no curation of devices with, with Amazons. Um, so that means um, it's less of a hassle to get onto the platform. Uh, but the drawback is that you can't actually buy their hardware here yet. There isn't a, a date announced for when you will be able to. I have a suspicion that they're, they're struggling with their accents or something. Um, but on the other hand, you don't need a hub. Um, your devices can talk straight to the cloud, or you can run the hub software on a, on a small embedded computer like a Raspberry Pi. Um, and they just announced a technology called Greengrass, which lets you push software components out to field devices. It's, it's not Docker, but it's a similar kind of thing. Um, I've been really impressed by the attention to security in, in their platform as well. Um, big news recently is, is Google has announced um, their Android Things toolkit. Um, it's got limited support for devices at the moment, but given that they just launched their, their building hub technology here in Australia, I expect to see um, that, that ecosystem expanding quite rapidly. And Microsoft has announced a thing they call Azure IoT Hub. Um, they claim that it's going to be cross-platform, um, but at the moment it's it's largely glossies and paper, so I, I can't tell you how well it works. Um, open Connectivity Foundation, um, they're the big player in, in, in open source. Um, they've published a set of device profiles that build on top of the universal plug and play technologies, which they've taken over stewardship of. Um, and that allows IoT developers to have a common language for discovering and interacting between devices. Um, so they have a reference toolkit called IoTivity. Um, it has bindings in, in C and C++ and Java. Um, they're not really the languages I would recommend using in IoT because I think um, safety above all is, is the criterion I would look for, but I hope to see support for other languages soon. Um, and when I spoke last year at Yale Connected, I talked about a framework that I was working on for smaller processes. So this is a um, this is an IoT processor that can be had for as little as two bucks. Um, and there's a, a new framework called Mongoose OS, which runs on these. Um, and these guys have really got it figured out. Uh, they have a host interface which runs on your workstation and, let, and gives you a, a web IDE. Uh, you can code in C or JavaScript. Um, and they take care of bundling up the software into an image that you can push out to the device, or you can have the devices pull for, for updates. 
Uh, there's an API framework which lets you communicate with them over message buses or web sockets or REST APIs. Um, and they, they build a Amazon AWS certificate enrollment into the system. So it's, it's three clicks and you're up and running with a secure connection to Amazon. Um, I want to throw one last framework into, into the mix. Um, this one's called Resin.io. Um, it's not open source, but they are good open source citizens in that they had a number of parts that they have open source. Uh, and the gist of this platform is that you write whatever language you want to use, um, you push your code up to a Git server in their cloud, and it builds it up into a bundle, put, wraps it in a Docker image, and then pushes it out to your devices. Um, very much like the kind of thing we would do in a, in a DevOps production flight. Um, and the devices all maintain a VPN connection back to, back to the cloud, so you can monitor them, their status, do remote upgrades, um, or shutdowns. Um, the drawbacks are that it's, it's only supported on, um, on a handful of, of hardware platforms at the moment. And you can only have one Docker container per device at the moment, which is not the way I like to work. I like to separate things into multiple, multiple containers. But if you can live with those restrictions, it's, it's, it's quite a nice platform. So home stretch, uh, what's missing? I think we need to move beyond letting devices connect to everything. I want to see those device profiles that describe device function be extended to describe security policy. So I can say, this toaster is allowed to talk to toaster.com only and nothing else. Um, and I think we need a way to relatively painlessly or certainly less painfully get a thousand devices onto your network without having to join a little Wi-Fi network created by each one and type a password in. Uh, you know, we need something like enterprise grade WPS or something like that. Um, and we need to work out how vulnerability alerting will happen at scale. Um, you know, I don't think I'm ever going to get any of my relatives to subscribe to Bug Track. So we need something which can tell people you need to fix your toaster. Um, and when we find a vulnerability, we need to get patches out to devices. So you know, there's, there's frameworks that have done good work here. And I really think it's essential that if you are building an IoT product, you must have it feel upgradable. It's simply not acceptable to ship a product with no hope of upgrades. We saw with, with um, MRI machines and train platforms and police cameras going offline last month that um, devices with no upgrade path are simply not merchantable. Um, I've got a whole another presentation which goes in, into how to do this and what technologies I've used. Um, and maybe we can, we can say that for another day. So finally, quick recap. Things are pretty awful, but that's not unexpected, and none of the awfulness is really intrinsic to IoT. If we choose the devices with some care, then you can install them in a way that mitigates those risks. If you're building devices, you're absolutely capable of doing the right thing. Um, and it's going to get easier over the next year or so as some of these new frameworks mature. So I hope you found that useful tonight. Um, and if not, I'll meet you at the beach with my shovel. Um, so thanks for listening, and I am happy to take questions now or afterwards. Um, my contact details are up there if you want to have a longer conversation. I uh, will put a link up to the slides on Meetup. And so thanks for listening, and over to you. Google Home kit, what do I need to worry about? You need to worry about. The Google um, Home thing that's listening yeah. all the time. I'd be, well, listening all the time is one thing. Yeah. Um, I, I do know that, um, that somebody did some investigations with the Amazon one to work out, is it actually streaming audio all the time to Amazon? They work out that, it, that they don't, that they, they listen for a, uh, a keyword <coughs> on the device. Only once they hear the keyword do they start streaming. So I'd be interested to know whether the Google works the same way. I haven't checked it. Um, I would say think about what kinds of things it can do. Um, an example is a neighbour came to to his neighbour's house to borrow a cup of sugar and uh, knock on the door, no answer. 
and he called out, hey Siri, unlock the front door, and then wandered straight in. <laughs> so if you do have voice control, think about um, what can you control, who can control it. Is, is the trust <laughs> Yes? Um, if I were to uh, replace all of the microwaves in my office with uh, IoT microwaves and the light bulbs with uh, Wi Fi light bulbs and yes. an echo dot on every desk, what tools should I be looking at to orchestrate or manage all of these thousands of devices that are suddenly going to flood my, uh, my office network? Um, it's very cool to manage all of this. Yes, I, I, I've, been, I've been using SaltStack, which is one of the one of the data center orchestration tools. So it gives me the ability to to send a command out to multiple devices or sets of devices or all the devices that happen to fulfill a particular role. Um, I feed all the data back um, using Elasticsearch to a to a, a data lake where I can then visualize. So I set up a dashboard which shows me the the devices. One of the one of the companies I work for builds a is a startup that builds safety systems for nursing homes, hospitals, those kinds of places, and so they have sensors, um, one per room, so potentially thousands of them, and all that data comes back to a dashboard, which gives them an overview of what's going on. Um, you might not think a, a an IoT microwave is a very useful thing, but I found um, in my last uh, full time job that. I would often wander into the, the break room, put some food in the microwave or the toaster, get stuck into a conversation, um, and then wander back, come back an hour later to find cold toast or cold noodles. So what I did was I made a, uh, a toaster which sends me a Slack message when the toast pops up so I can pop it down and wander off. It would be useful to know when the microwaves are already occupied, so I don't know if I'm going to find the microwaves. Yes? There was an interesting story recently about uh, someone who's a pacemaker card which was admitted into evidence trial. I heard about that, yes. Yeah. So I was just wondering, um, I mean, given what you talked about, 19 that we didn't want to bring the card to the uh -huh. and then uh, envision that those people would be something like there is, there is a murder trial going on right now where they're attempting to subpoena records from Amazon to see if the Amazon Echo that was in the room recorded everything. Amazon say that there are no such recordings and are resisting going into detail. Um, I think the, the investigations that um, that, um, that Patrick did recently on, on checking that seem to support that it hasn't been triggered. It's not sending anything. Um, certainly, I think things like vehicles snitching on us is, is already happening. We have. Um, <laughs> The braking data and the speed data from cars being in, used in crash investigations. I'm sure we'll find other applications as we go along of ways that our houses can, um, can tell on us. I wouldn't be at all surprised if we see police trying to get records of power consumption to find drug labs, that kind of thing. So there's, um, you know, with big data comes big problems, but uh, I think the, the genie is not going to go back into the bottle very easily. Yes. I I am aware of Rust. I have not yet learned it. I'm currently working in in either Go or JavaScript. Yes. This is the thing that could be but shouldn't be connected to the internet. This thing that could be but shouldn't. Uh, <laughs> ICBMs. <laughs> now we had we had the the Iranian uh, uranium refinery sabotaged by the um, current theory is the Israelis uh, caused the centrifuges to go berserk and wreck themselves. Well, that's the thing. Um, a lot of people say. Oh, I don't need to worry about security because this thing's never going to be connected to the internet. All those MRI machines that went down um, a couple of weeks ago, the police security uh, speed cameras that went down here in Victoria, um, I suspect that people thought they were never going to be connected to the internet. Um, air gaps are a myth. 
everything will either get connected to the internet sooner or later on purpose or by accident, or the data will get through anyhow. You'll have um, you know, plain old sneaker net, you'll have um, people figure out ways to get connections. Either you, somebody brings a, a mobile phone and plugs it into their computer, everything is connected. If you just presume that everything is connected, even when you think that you won't ever connect it, um, that's the right mindset to have. Any other questions? Kind of goes to the element of, we have CCTV here, so I'm really close circuit. Um, I'm not sure I understand what the question is. <laughs> yeah, but those, yeah, those systems that you think are just a wire going from here to here and they don't connect to anything else, um, sooner or later they will. All right, I think that's it. Please join me in thanking Christopher.